So welcome to our session on the Indianapolis Community Land Trust and in particular information for people who might want to do a discount sale or potentially donate property to the Indianapolis CLT and just having some understanding of how that even works. So again, my name is uh, Alvin with uh, Alvin Sangswongo with Kepra Institute and also the Indianapolis Community Land Trust. Um, been a part of Kepra for about 13 years. Again, life-changing kind of experience and really like, and, and again, we want to emphasize this for the, the Indianapolis Community Land Trust as well. It's really like the people and the relationships that we build that are the most important. And again, projects like a community land trust is a way to do that through real estate or through housing and finding a way to share that with each other and transfer equity to people who haven't had access to it traditionally. So uh, again, like while we are going to talk about some very like maybe boring legal stuff, keep in mind that really the heart of it is our ability to have relationships with each other and build relationships with each other. So with that, I will go ahead and kick it over to Jeff to kick us off. And we also have Matt. He, he, Matt on the call, who's our um, lawyer or attorney with Ice Miller, who will be here to answer any specific like legal questions about tax benefits, inheritance, anything specific to Indiana. So again, feel free and please do ask any questions. There's no stupid questions. So anything you're curious about, please put it in the chat or unmute and ask away. That I'll pass it to Jeff. Thanks, Alvin. What a great setup. I, I, I seldom get the chance to say I, I get an opportunity to say whatever I want to, knowing that a, an attorney is going to have to clean up anything that I misrepresent. So um, I like it. I, I feel like maybe that's what I need every day of my life is just an attorney to clean up the mistakes of things I say. Um, so um, then you would be a politician. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Jeff Washburn. I'm, I'm a Recovering executive director, and, and and I'm a consultant right now, um, working with a, a, a firm that's called Burlington Associates. I've been I've had the privilege of working with um, the NDCLT folks in the Keffer Institute for better half, easily over a half a year now, uh, working with them on really kind of setting up and establishing the Community Land Trust there in Indianapolis. Uh, as I try to establish some credibility, uh, I did grow up in northeastern Indiana. I went to college in southwestern Indiana, so I have some familiarity. My mom still lives in Indiana, but I'm joining you all from uh, Pittsburgh, the basement of a hotel in Pittsburgh uh, this evening, uh, and I call Minneapolis, Minnesota home. So a uh, little disoriented myself, but uh, looking to get home tomorrow uh, to to Minneapolis. So um, I wanted to share all that in that the, the organization I worked for for 21 years was a community land trust that served the city of Minneapolis. And um, we, we were able to grow that organization over over that that time period and, and had many instances, uh, which forced me to kind of think through how we we be good stewards and be a good neighbor to to the residents of Minneapolis. And um, so I'm, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how we got to the, the Indy CLT legacy fund over the first couple of slides, and then speak a little bit to the mechanics of um, uh, primarily property donations. But I, I think you'll see in a couple of these slides, we can talk about a whole bunch of different ways that folks might be interested in, in assisting the in the Indy CLT. Think about uh, permanency and community in the way that in the work that they're doing. Uh, so uh, Indy CLT is uh, Using the term the Indy CLT Legacy Fund, uh, my understanding of this term is it's not just encompassing of somebody that might be looking at at um, donating their property or selling a property at a dis discount to the Indy CLT, but it but it encompasses a whole bunch of different ways that somebody might think about making a contribution to the Indy CLT. Uh, for the purpose of the bulk of this conversation, we're going to be talking about the the mechanics of how to sell at a discount or donate a property to the to the Indy CLT. So essentially, in short, it's it's if an individual um, agreed to sell their home at a discount or or donate their property to the to the Indy CLT, with the understanding that the Indy CLT would would then uh, take that home and and turn around and sell it to an income qualified lower income household, with the goal and purpose to ensure that that home stays permanently affordable for multiple generations of of lower income um, households in in Indianapolis. Um, those 
discounted sales or a donation like that, just talking about it from a practitioner's perspective is golden in the sense that Alvin and Stephanie and the team at NDCLT are going to, as much as they may not like fundraising, are going to be spending a lot of time fundraising to raise dollars to then turn around and invest in households to help them achieve their, their dream and goal of, of, of better housing for themselves and their family. And to the degree that we as administrators can, can leverage these private, we'll call them private donations, um, it goes a long way in demonstrating to public funders and philanthropy that, that we have a broad base of support from the community. And so there's a real practical aspect, not only in that it's a monetary uh, investment, but it's it's also really significant as we go out and try and leverage a lot of other dollars to, to help more households. Um, the other thing, I think from a practical perspective, uh, you know, households who are able to make this type of a benevolent donation or sale, uh, there are benefits um, that they receive, but also, again, the community benefits from those those investments today and long term. Um, why why are we doing this? Well, it, it, it's gotten way worse. I mean, part of the reason that we're on this call is that housing costs, construction costs, interest rates, um, cost of you know construction and and, and uh, materials have all gone up, and it's it's really impacting those least able to weather the those 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 increases in in the lower income and um, under resourced and underserved communities of, of Indianapolis. Um, there's a lot of interest and, and I think concern. I mean, we heard this in the intros that people want to do better for the community. And this is a, a good way to match that interest with 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 creating an opportunity today and or down the road for, for the community. Um, you know, also I think it's not, this isn't everybody, and there's 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 many people that that need to think about if they have children, if they have, you know, special um purposes or, or causes they want to make sure that they're they're interested in supporting uh, they might not be able to fully donate their property but I think there's a number of folks um, who have benefited from huge appreciation in their homes over the years and they got into home ownership saying you know what if if I bought a home and it doubled in price through the life of ownership that would be more than I could ever imagine and and all of a sudden they find themselves in a position where their home is tripled or quadrupled in value, uh, you know, I think about when my parents purchased a home for fifty thousand dollars and what it's worth today. You know, I don't, I don't know if their thought was, "This is what I'm planning on on making when I go to sell." But as as they get older, they're like, "I don't know how much do I really need? How much is important for me to have? Is there a way that I can meaningfully give it back to the community?" Um, especially if if their kids don't need anything, you know, this is a way that they can leave a legacy. Um, I think there's benefit as well. And from a practical perspective, uh, I'll talk a little bit about my own experience administering a program like this. You know, we were able to move quickly. Um, we were able to make the sale of a home a less anxious or anxiety inducing experience. Uh, and I think we did it for, you know, well, at no cost to the seller, but it definitely came as a benefit to us. And we'll talk a little bit about the, those, those benefits. And then lastly, and, and, um, uh, I think this is important to a lot of folks that that um, that need this, but there is also a, a, a tax benefit for, for making that that financial contribution uh, through a donation or a reduced sale of of a property to the Indy CLT. So, in addition to this donated sale, I thought it'd be worth just kind of lift, lifting up a number of different ways that that households could consider making a donation uh, or. A, creating some sort of benefit to the, to the NDCLT. We talked a little bit about, you know, a direct donation of a home or vacant parcel. Second to that would be, look, I, maybe I still owe something on my home. So I know I can't, you know, donate the whole thing, but uh, you know, once the proceeds or once the mortgage is paid off, there's going to be a little bit left there, or maybe I can only sell it at 50% of what the future appraised value is going to be because there's some other things I want to leave, uh, you know, some funds to, to some other charities, and, but I will give the Indy CLT the opportunity to purchase the property at a discount. Um, retain life estate um, where, where somebody can transfer the ownership to the Indy CLT, but they, they retain the right to live in the property. Um, this is an instance where the, it would, probably only work if somebody had fully paid off their mortgage obligation on the property, but, you know, they could get into a situation with the NDCLT and say, look, I, I want to, at this point in time, I, I want to donate the land underneath my home. 
to the NDCLT. I'm okay being subject to you know some variation of the ground lease, even if I'm not income qualified at this point in time, with the understanding that if and when I ever do decide to sell, it's going to revert back to the NDCLT and we're going to, and we're going to sell it to an income qualified household. Um, bequests, uh, a homeowner could, could leave the property to the, the NDCLT uh, in a living trust. Um, and, and so at that point in time, uh, the homeowner pass, uh, there, there would be the proceeds of that sale would go to the NDCLT, and those dollars could be used to to assist additional households uh, in, in in finding better housing. And then uh, an option request that that's going to list some sort of a, a percent or dollar amount that gives the NDCLT the opportunity to purchase the property uh, upon someone's passing at at a at a lower at a lower below market cost. Um, and then lastly, the life income estate again. Somebody says, I'm not, I'm not going to sell it directly to the Indy CLT, but it's going to go into a trust and I'm going to name the Indy CLT as a beneficiary for as long as this trust is paying out dollars and, and those dollars would, you know, for X number of years or into, you know, the future, depending on the amount of money would be, there'd be a, an annual contribution that would be made to the Indy CLT uh, to, to help them fulfill their, their mission. Any questions on these? Cause we, we have an attorney online who'll answer anything that I, I botched up there. And we also had Nicholas Johnson, who's oh, two attorneys team, and another <laughs> attorney. <laughs> so Nicholas, you want to introduce yourself briefly. And uh, we did number color and uh, your favorite cold beverage drink when it's hot out like this. Oh, wow. Thank you, everybody. Happy to be with you here. Of course, happy Thursday. Um, now that we're going to get a little rain, it's, um, let's see, my number, is, uh, let's go with a 9.8. Um, let's go uh, color uh, royal black and my favorite beverage uh, and I had one today is uh, my my Arnold Palmer with the lemonade and iced tea. Awesome. Thanks, Nicholas. So I'll kick it back to the, the crew, the audience. Does anyone have any questions about anything Jeff just covered? Or even comments? Does it make sense? want us to keep going or yeah the, alvin the only thing that i i think jeff i think your your overview was was wonderful and, and spot on i i think it may be just a, a a quick comment which is depending upon the type of donation and the structure it takes it, it is going to uh, dictate the amount of the tax deduction that results so depending upon the, the structure that's utilized all can produce great tax benefits in terms of a charitable contribution deduction but the value and amount depends upon the the structure of the donation and how it how it is how it occurs thank you counsel um i do have i do have a disclaimer later on like Whatever you do, make sure to, to to consult with your 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 own attorney and your own uh, accountant uh, before you make any of these moves. Uh, and I'm haven't been on the other side of it, so so I, I don't know the answers of that. All right, move on from this slide. Then uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about my own experience uh, as an administrator. So again, I worked for the Community Land Trust that served the city of Minneapolis. Uh, over the life of our organization, um, to date, about 400 homes and trusts, and we we saw about 150 resales, so you know over 550 households. Um, as as we matured as an organization, there was you know an increased interest, and in, I I you know dozens if not hundreds of conversations over the years uh, with folks who said, hey, I, I you know I, I'm going to leave my home in the land, I'm going to leave my the my home um, in my will to the land trust or I can't leave my home because I want to make sure that my kid gets a hundred thousand dollars. But everything on top of that, I'm I want to give you guys an option to purchase my home for X amount or X percent of the future appraised value. And and I feel confident that there's probably a lot of those are sitting out there. Um, people are still living in their homes, but down the road, you know, just those conversations, being able to plant the seed uh, with people to 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 list this as an option, and they could name it one year and then. Three years later, could decide that maybe they need, they need to change that. So we don't know how this will all play out, but I feel pretty confident that those conversations, um, taking the time and, and being able to talk with with other residents of the city of Minneapolis, yielded opportunities that we don't know are going to hit until years down the road. And um, 
I, I really appreciate that. I know it's something that me and my wife have even uh, talked about doing as we're, we're thinking about planning is how we how we name uh, our community land trust as, as a beneficiary or create some sort of an opportunity there. Um, so there's been this ongoing interest, but I, I got to tell you, the, the thing that really kind of triggered just um, a ton of interest in Minneapolis was um, the ridiculous killing of, of George Floyd. And, and from that moment forward, um, I'd say at least weekly, I'd, I'd receive one or a couple calls or emails from people saying, hey, um, I know the city of Minneapolis is trying to do better, that we're trying to, to figure our path forward, but it's not fast enough or good enough for me. And um, what what can you do, City of Lakes Community Land Trust? Um, I'm, I'm thinking about selling my home and I want to make sure that it gets sold to a, to a, to a black household. And, and so because <laughs> we use public funds, we couldn't make that kind of a guarantee. But we could share that, you know, our percentages of, of folks that we do typically help probably align very well with, with their value system. And and we said, look, um, and if we don't, the first sale, there's going to be subsequent sales. And if we keep doing the good work that we're doing, uh, we will, you know, serve, serve a black household. We definitely will serve an under-resourced household, um, just the way that we do our work. And and it it connected with people. And, and I think people said, you know, I can... I can go this, through this proper process and I can sell my home and make a bunch of money or I can sell it to you all and you all are going to guarantee that this home is going to be permanently affordable for future generations of folks uh, in, in my in, in this Minneapolis community and uh, really just kind of blew things up. And it really forced me to spend some time to essentially just create a system that made sense not only for myself and my colleagues at my office, but, but try and create a clear process and path for anybody who wanted to engage in this conversation so we can make it easy for them instead of me stumbling around, well, let me look into it and I'll get back to you. If somebody's interested, how do we how do we make sure that we're attentive and we're getting back to them right away? So that was the, the kind of the very practical aspect from an organizational perspective. As I shared, it created great opportunity for matching public funds. Um, and in our experience, we probably did close to in just the last, you know, last three or four years, um, maybe... 10 to 12 homeowners uh, sold their homes at a significant discount to uh, the City of Lakes Community Land Trust. Uh, all of those instances were what I'll call acquisition rehab. So we would acquire them at a discount. We'd probably do sometimes a little bit of rehab. Sometimes it required a lot of rehab. And then we turn around and sold them to income qualified households in Minneapolis. Uh, two of the sellers were uh, what I'll call friendly nonprofit partners who had, you know, single family homes that were maybe made affordable through another program. They were rental uh, and they they no longer wanted to be landlords. And so they said, look, we don't own a lot on these and we'll sell them to you at a discount. But across the board, as you see, when I talk about what the guidelines for the program were, was that we were always suggesting at least a 20 percent discount off the appraised value or what would what would you call or consider the the fair market value of the home today? Um, but through these conversations, on average, the discount was actually forty one percent. So let's say Alvin was thinking about donating a home to to my community land trust. I'd say Alvin, would you consider twenty percent? At the end of those conversations, we got to a place where Alvin was like, you know what? I think I can I can absorb a forty one percent discount off the sale of the of the property. So it worked out. Just phenomenal, and I think that the generosity of again what I'll what I'll call benevolent sellers was um, really kind of blew my mind, and, and in such a positive way, and made me just you know love love my my struggling city more than ever because of the people who 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 were really kind of thinking about the long term uh, uh, long term community and 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 uh, uh, thinking about what what we can be doing to make a better community. Um. So the way we structured that, uh, just a few bullet points here, and then there is a, a kind of a support document that, that we always accompanied when, when somebody was interested in this, just to lay out the steps. Um, we'd ask them to review that one page or document. Um, we'd talk down, we'd sit down, I'd have conversations. You know, if I could take somebody out for a cup of coffee, just start talking about this, um, make sure they didn't have any questions. Uh, we would then want to make sure that we establish some sort of an ideal sense of what the property value was. And so um, we had a realtor company that we, our organization owned, and it was pretty easy for us to get one of our realtors to establish. It wasn't an appraised value, but it was a pretty good understanding of how much the property was worth. And so they'd come back and say, well, we think the value of the property is X. 
And so that would start the conversation. We'd say, look, we think the value of the property is X. Do you think you'd be willing to sell your home for less than or 20% less than X as a starting point? And if they they felt like they could weather that, um, we take it to the next step. I think it's also worth noting here that, you know, part of this conversation, if somebody was looking, getting ready to sell their home, they're already looking at, and these were old realtor rules, they're already looking at having to pay a realtor somewhere between five and a half and 7%. So in reality, if they didn't have to pay that realtor fee, we were, our, our, our ask was really closer to, you know, 14% discount off of the, the appraised value. And so we'd have that conversation as well. Um, we would ask if we could walk through the property. Um, you know, I will say this about everybody, not just people who are making maybe a potential donation, but uh, everybody thinks their home is in maybe in way better shape than what we do in the affordable housing space because we have to bring everything up to, to government standards in most cases. Um, and so, you know, despite somebody saying it's perfect, it doesn't need anything, we'd always want to kind of make sure that uh, we had a good sense of what needed to be done before we could sell it, especially if we we incorporated any public money in the, the rehab or resell of the property. Um, we do that. We, if, if there were uh, rehab items, we'd, we'd have that conversation with the homeowner. And, and, and sometimes that's what resulted in a deeper discount. We, we helped make the case. Uh, we typically were bringing additional dollars to it. And so we'd piece together what we thought would be a, a scenario that would work that would be able to get us to a point of selling it to a, an income qualified household, lower income household. And if if that worked, we'd write up a purchase offer, the homeowner would sell it, and uh, we would then order a formal appraisal, which is required for this process and the steps that I'll, I'll go through in the next couple of slides. Uh, but we would order and we would pay for an appraisal the homeowner would have to let the appraiser come out and walk through the property as well to establish that that appraised value. And we'd move forward to a closing um, time that was convenient for the homeowner. Uh, it was really that simple, uh, provided everything was kind of working and, and the numbers worked out for everybody. Here's a copy or of that one pager. Uh, Alvin has this. He can share this with, with everybody who, who's attended this evening. But it kind of lays out those steps uh, in a more detailed manner than what the previous slide did. Uh, but but pretty pretty straightforward. Naming the documents, naming the steps, um, and and making sure that those details are are, are covered. Uh, here's a really interesting copy of a form eighty two eighty three uh, put out by the IRS. Um, so if the homeowner, in most cases, we would do this regardless of whether they want it or not, just in case. If um, this is the formal document that the IRS needs, uh, as you'll see toward the bottom, there's a signature line where an appraiser has to sign off in established value. Uh, nonprofit or NDCLT's nonprofit information would have to be included here and um, specific market information about that property would be filled out um, and then given to you. You sign it and you would you know, then share that with your, your attorney or, or, or accountant. Uh, the net of all this is that the homeowner, let's say when 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 Alvin sold his home to me at a discount and it was, you know, forty thousand dollar benefit uh, or tax donation essentially, which is the difference between what it appraises at and the value that he sold it to us for. Um, essentially, he could deduct forty thousand dollars, however he and his accountant choose fit, uh, over the next five years. So maybe it doesn't make sense for him to do to do any deductions in twenty twenty five. But his his accountant is saying, look, in 2026, you're going to have some tax liability. You, you may want to put a bigger chunk there. So it, it it is, I guess, a pretty pretty flexible tool for those who who need to be making those kinds of charitable contributions and and uh, are trying to offset their tax liability. Um, some things to consider. You know, sometimes we engaged with with potential um, sellers, and they had already retained a, a realtor. Um, and so, you know, when that happens, then then it's tougher to, to talk about the full benefit um, because they're if they're already enlisted with a realtor, they're going to have to pay out that 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 agent uh, fee or you know figure out some way to compensate them. So that it kind of complicates it. So you know, I always ask if if you haven't already sat down and met with an with a realtor or you haven't um, signed the listing agreement with them, um, please consider holding off until we go through this process, just so we we can do this and we have somebody that can represent. 
um, that purchase offer and, and it's going to be pretty straightforward. They still may want to run it by, encourage them to still run it by their attorney, but it, it doesn't mean that they need to be paying out fees. Um, we always ask them if they're willing to, you know, pay the closing costs, pay their share of the closing costs. Um, maybe that doesn't work uh, and it's not a big deal, but, it, you know, every little dollar helps uh, organizations like ours. And so it's always worth the ask. Um, identify any um, items in the property. You know, if they can self-identify, like, look, I, I've been having leaks coming into my foyer. I don't know where it's coming from. That helps us out in helping to identify what types of deferred maintenance and rehab things we'd want to take care of before we sold it on to a household. Um, we'd also want to know uh, if if they're planning on leaving any items in the property. Um, you know, like, I just thought you'd want that piano, right? Like, so I think just getting a good sense, if that's the case, we can plan ahead and we can probably find somebody who, who would love a piano. But um, if we don't know about it, then it's 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 always helpful to know. Uh, what what pieces of furniture, you know, our assumption is understanding that uh, they'll, they'll be selling us a home without any furniture in it, but just making sure to know that. Uh, here's my disclaimer, you know, we'd always want them to know uh, that they should sit down and meet with their own accountant, their own attorney to do what's best for them. And, and then just let the, the NDCLT know if they want to be part of the journey, right? Like, this is a pretty cool thing. Um, there were a couple homes uh, where we did some significant rehab, the homeowner knew we were going to have to do some work on the property. And they said, you know, we'd love to be part of, you know, the, you know, a, you know, housewarming party or, you know, once you're done with this. And they said, we want to invite our neighbors over that, you know, a lot of people lived in their neighborhoods for 30 years. They wanted to kind of do a bit of a send off. And so we'd host a party, we'd bring in some food. And, and I think they just really appreciated being part of that journey. And other people, they may just say, nope. I don't, I don't need anything. I, I just wanted, I want to do this thing. So, uh, you know, just, I think there is that opportunity and I'm feeling pretty confident that knowing the Indy CLT, this is stuff that they, they do really well and, and community is, is huge to the organization. Uh, and this just wrapping up. Um, legacy fund benefits, uh, your home will be permanently affordable for future generations of lower income homeowners. No home, no realtor costs unless you're already under contract. Um, you can claim the charitable tax deductions over the next five years. You're able to close and sell at a time that's convenient for you. Uh, and uh, the NDCLT. So let's say, you know, like, oh, I want to sell my home, but the bathroom, the way it's the way it's set up, nobody's going to ever buy my home because I have fuchsia tile and that's just not thing that's going to sell this year and and so you, to sell you know that you still got to go through this process of finding somebody to come in demo the bathroom put in new tile blah 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 blah. and, and the ndclt says we're going to buy it as is there's things that need to get fixed we're going to take care of them you don't have to do anything um there there could be a real benefit in that from a timing perspective and from a cost perspective and a headache perspective all those things and then lastly uh just become a, an ndclt supporting member um i'm guessing i may be overstepping here but if Somebody made a sizable contribution. They would they would also have a you know a say in the in a future um, tether and connection to the NDCLT moving forward. And I think that's it, Alvin. All right, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it, Matt. Do you want to add in anything before we open it up? No, I I, I think I thought it was a great overview. Um, nothing nothing significant to add from from my perspective. Um, maybe anecdotally, I will tell you I I've, I've been a tax exempt attorney for going on fifteen years now and worked with a lot of amazing organizations and projects. But um, this is pretty unique and special, particularly for Indianapolis. Um, so um, just as an aside, I'm I'm really excited to be a part of it. Thanks, Matt. And what would you say when you say it, you, it feels unique and special? What about it for you? Yeah, you know, affordable housing is a huge issue in Indianapolis, right? Um, but this is a, a unique and, from my perspective, fresh approach on trying to tackle the affordable housing issue in Indianapolis. Um, and and that is, um, it, it's really neat to see. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for being a part of it. <laughs> Nicholas, did you want to add anything in? Uh, of course, ditto everything that uh, Matt and Jeff have said. I mean, of course, great community and economic development tool and um, would definitely um, would definitely 
uh, encourage, um, you know, that uh, anyone interested in potentially, you know, like Jeff said, sitting down, having that conversation uh, about a property, um, definitely try to entertain that. Um, I don't know um, if we're going to have additional information about what that process is, so like for, for us to be able to have those conversations, but um, we definitely want to make sure we let people know um, how how to how to go about setting up one of those conversations, but to that yeah, end, that's perfect. It's like I planted you on the audience, <laughs> so <laughs> I put a link to the one pager. So I think that's definitely a first step, and then a second step. I'm gonna put a link. There's a page on the ndclt.org website specific to people who want to sell or uh, at a discount or donate property. At the bottom of that is like a and it, there's a link to the the one page or two but there's a interest form if people have a property that they're thinking about selling in the near term or far term whatever um if you're interested you can fill out that that page and it's ndclt.org slash sell is the web address And then once you fill it out, we'll we'll contact you. Or people can also just email us, and we can set up a, a time. And the in the email is info at ndclt.org, which comes to the whole team. And I I was just going to ask real quick. I uh, meant to say, um, the the range or diversity of of different types of property, whether they could be single family, multifamily, duplexes, triplexes. Can you even donate a mobile home? Like, what's the range of different uh, real estate uh, properties that you could potentially donate? Great question. And uh, it may bounce back to you, Nicholas, and, and Matt, in, the, in my response. But clearly, I think single family homes and duplexes will, will, would be a much easier uh, type of donation. I think vacant parcels, uh, if somebody just, you know, if they had a vacant lot sitting somewhere, that that would also be a pretty easy one. Where I think it gets a little complicated if if someone is subject to an HOA, um, and um, the NDCLT was to get into title, it might be difficult for them to then put some sort of a future uh, resale or income restriction on that property without consent of the HOA. And so, in instances like that, NDCLT can talk about this. My 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 recommendation would be that might be a conversation with the homeowner to say, look, this is going to be really hard to do with your property, but if you sell it to us at a discount and allow us to sell it to market, we could take those proceeds um, and, and use them to maybe buy a, and, and apply a, a affordable opportunity elsewhere. I think it's just going to be tough to, to convert some properties over others um, that that have other types of restrictions or processes that the that the NDCLT would have to try and navigate. Uh, essentially, if there's title to land underneath it that would exclusive to the structure on top of it, it should work relatively easy to do that. Anyone else have questions? And if not, let's just go around and get some feedback. Any any thoughts or let's start with Sherry. I'll pick on you since you were <laughs> sharing so much earlier. Um, we'd love to just hear, you know, what, what you think about this. Is this something that you think people might have some interest in? If so, which parts? And if so, you know, what, what do you think about this as a strategy? Sherry, for some reason we can't hear you. You're unmuted, but I don't know if you have headphones somewhere. Mm -hmm. No, we can't hear you again. Try again. Hello, hello. Yeah, we hear you now. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, okay. No um, so I just want to make sure I understand. So the... The... Um, I guess the ideal way to donate from what I'm hearing is if the house is paid off. Is that correct? He now he's muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> if, if, if you know, if you were gonna leave your home um 
I, I don't know if the if the, if the mortgage is going to cause any sort of an issue. Um, it would just if you were going to sell your home at a discount, or you know if you, you couldn't leave the home to the the land trust if there was a mortgage obligation. But if you're going to sell it at a discount, and the amount that the NDCLT was still going to allowed you to pay off the mortgage uh, balance, and there still would be this opportunity to sell the discount, there would not be an issue with that. That would all get settled out at the closing of purchase. Um, okay. Because, okay, because I saw the model on the first one, and that, so that was the part, because you gave an example of if the house was 250, but the person sold it at a discount for 150, you guys would cover the the difference so, but so i yeah so uh thank you great great entry and mm -hmm. and, and i think i'll just share for folks that, that weren't part of the conversation earlier this week we had an example of um essentially what a buyer experience would be and the example we used there was uh, a property a house worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars and the buyer only able to get a mortgage for $150,000. And Sherry, I think we're getting a little feedback through your microphone. So I'm going to mute you and just unmute when you want to talk again. Oh, yeah, you got it. Okay, great. Um, you know, so a buyer only able to, to purchase or get a mortgage for $150,000. Uh, and the, the NDCLT would provide $100,000 to bridge that difference. In, this, in a situation like this, let's just use some, some comparable numbers, if you're okay with it, Sherry. Let's say that uh, we'll use you as an example. Uh, you're willing to sell your three hundred thousand. Uh, you're willing to sell your two hundred thousand dollar valued home to the NDCLT for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So they're buying it from you for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You're able. You're you're willing to sell it at a discount. So you're going to see that tax benefit um, of of selling it at a discount. The NDCLT now has one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But let's say. They're working with a buyer that can only get a hundred and twenty thousand dollar mortgage. They would take that benefit that you passed on, the fifty thousand dollars, and more than likely, well, they would have to raise another thirty thousand dollars to add to the benefit you provided to be able to sell it to that next household for one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, even though the property is worth two hundred thousand dollars. And then moving forward, that benefit would get passed on to subsequent, re, uh, you know, income qualified households if and when that household decides, decides to sell. Does that kind of piece it together? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Sherry. Yeah, and I'll also give the example, Julia. And and if you weren't, if you were at the launch party, she shared her story. It's also on the website. She contacted us, and this kind of inspired us putting this together. Um, because she bought a new home in Irvington about six years ago, new construction home for about $200,000. And now they're looking, they're building a new home currently. And again, they financially don't need to get all the money, even though it might be worth $300,000 now. She's like, hey, could could we sell it to you for $200,000? Like what we bought it for, which again is like a $100,000 donation of equity, just assuming it does appraise at $300,000. Which, um, I mean, we might have, again, we might have to add more money to make it affordable for the people that we're trying to support in home ownership. So if, again, someone could, a family could only afford like a $150,000 mortgage, then we would find another 50. But it's that contribution allows uh, us to get someone in a home, maybe when we have less resources, or to get them into a home that, that is even like a either a nicer home or in an area that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford with just what we have to contribute. Okay, now I'm gonna pick on my mom. <laughs> have you got any questions or thoughts on any of this? I do have a question. Okay, you've got a mortgage, uh yeah. like for example, let's say I owe $60,000 on my home and I want to sign it over to you or, and let's say it appraises at 160, right? So mm -hmm. you would, I could sign it over to you, but after, would you, would you buy it or, and pay off the mortgage or would I just pay off the mortgage with what I get for the house? I, I'm, I'm a little confused about that mortgage thing. Thanks, Betty. Are you, you are you presuming you would stay in the home after you signed it no, over? Hey, no, let's say I'm leaving the home. Okay, all right, good, good. 
let's say I hate to say this, have passed away. Okay, and but I I have sign. I would like to sign over the house, but I do still have a mortgage. Yep. So how does that work? I'm still a little unclear about that. So let's let's play that out. Let's say it's it's worth one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, and you owe sixty thousand dollars on it. Uh, you pass away, um, but you you're willing to sell it to the NDCLT, or you're willing to give it to them, less the mortgage obligation that you have. So essentially. They would step in, pay off that mortgage, and they would get the home for what was owed on the mortgage. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, that makes sense. But let's say I wanted to get thirty thousand out, then they would just get the difference of whatever the equity is, and they would also get a tax break of sorts. Yeah, you you would see at that point in time a thirty thousand um, dollar tax uh, benefit. Okay, and that would be part of the estate then, or the, you know. Yeah, I'm passed away. So does yeah. do the tax break even if I'm passed away or I ask an attorney. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the, have estate, one here. The, the estate will the estate will likely get a benefit in that situation. Oh, that's what I'm yes, okay, Betty, yeah. I guess think what, it's... Betty, we still we still pay we still pay taxes in the year that we pass away. Oh, so yeah. if, as long as you take one breath of life come January first um, <laughs> of that year, we're gonna still file a tax return. In, in, in most cases, we're going to still file a tax return. Okay. And Matt, did you have something you were adding in to that? No, the only, and I don't want to overcomplicate this and get too far in the weeds. So I'm, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm, ur, I'm, I'm holding back my urges uh, of getting too technical here. But just so everybody's aware, because in a lot of situations there are mortgages, right, um, on on homes. That mortgage, as Jeff kind of walked through the discount sale, right? If if you're selling your house and there's a mortgage on it that the the paying off on the mortgage is part of the sale proceeds. So if we're going back to that example of it's 106 worth 160,000, right? And and NDCLT comes in and just pays off that mortgage, that $60,000 payment is as if NDCLT is buying your home for $60,000. So there's still a $100,000 charitable contribution deduction in our example, but there's a there's a sale of the home for $60,000. Thanks, Matt. That was real clear. And and Betty, in in the example where you said you want to take thirty thousand out, you, uh -huh. would, you would then have to change the the sale price from sixty to ninety because you still have to satisfy the sixty thousand remainder on the mortgage. Um, and more than likely, I mean, the property would definitely be worth more than sixty thousand, and probably a lot worth worth more than ninety because um, it's almost impossible um, at this point to buy. Um, any single family home in Indianapolis for, you know, for under 200,000. I mean, some condos out there, but not, not many single family, I mean, across all the, the neighborhoods in the city. Well, and what, what I like about the CLT is the fact that uh, an individual owner can take, can, can do something about affordable housing. That's correct. Yep. 100%. Thanks mom. And I think I saw Charlotte on mute. Charlotte, would you like to share something or ask questions? I just, yeah, um, sure. Thank you. Um, I think I will have a lot more questions and would love to talk more, but this seems like it's like an, ins an insanely good tax benefit and for everybody involved. Like it, that would be passed down as well. Is that, am I, am I reading into that correctly that? the benefit of sales would be passed on to those families. Are you talking about in the, the you're saying when someone passes away and they have a tax benefit, what happens? Does it go to? No, the, I'm saying purchase? for the, for the families who are purchasing homes. So for a family who purchases a home, when they, through CLT, mm -hmm. they buy the house, they live there and then they're ready to sell it. So they sell the home. Do they get those benefits as well? They don't. Like, okay. It goes back into CLT. Yeah. So the any of that benefit that was donated from uh, the, the benevolent seller uh, stays with the property and it, it essentially acts like a, a grant or a 0% loan in the transaction. So it, um, you know, it doesn't oh, okay. really impact their, their need to get a mortgage or, 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 
necessarily impact their their financial uh, or, oh, or tax obligations cool. in any way. Okay, got it. So it's is it like a lease through CLT almost? No, it's a purchase. It's yeah. So the the land trust okay. is is purchasing the the property from the benevolent seller, and then when they go to sell uh, the property to an income qualified household or income household. Uh, what they are doing is just selling the structure or the improvements and retaining ownership of the land in that that essentially that financial benefit that the buyer is getting is tied to the title of the land. Uh, but, uh, you know, the the home that household would still, you know, they're buying a property example I used with uh, used, you know, previously, they're buying that two hundred fifty thousand dollar home with one hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollar mortgage. So in theory, they could realize the benefit of having a mortgage interest reduction based on that $150,000 mortgage. But the reality is a lot of these deductions and a lot of these benefits as it relates to, to, to tax benefit, just don't, they don't benefit lower income households the way they do people who have means mm. and, and being able to use Go those, figure. those tools and levers <laughs> the way that, that people okay. just, just have a lot of tax obligations do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So I do have one more question. Okay, so someone has bought the house from the land trust. So the land trust, let's say they want to sell that house. How does that work on their end when they're ready to sell it? Does it still go back to the land trust then? Thank you. I guess that was more my question. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. <laughs> um, you know, the goal the goal of the land trust is once it's in the land trust, um, it's going to stay in the land trust. And so from that point forward, they are just selling the improvements or the structure, the building that sits on top of the land and retaining ownership of the land and that benefit that the benevolent, the benevolent seller had provided through the discount sale is going to stay with the property as well to, to be passed on to every subsequent home buyer. Okay. Yeah, and so that's resold based off the resale formula. So again, that is the 2% appreciation every year based oh. off what they paid for it. So- in that case that we talked about, if someone was only able to afford a hundred thousand dollar mortgage and they bought it for a hundred thousand dollars, even if it was like again, don't either funded by grants or government or donated by an individual person, like what they get is based off what they paid in, plus the two percent every year. And if they made any major renovations or improvements, there's a system to get credit for those. Okay. So they do get something, but do they get that when they sell it or do they get that every yeah. year? They when get they sell. sell it. Yeah. Oh. And then they okay. sell it. Just like regular, it's just like regular home ownership, with right. the exception that there are certain things in the ground lease, like paying $50 a month to the community land trust to support it. And in our case, paying $50 into a repair reserve fund to basically create a savings account for the property in case oh. it needs like major exterior repair later on to help pay for it. It may not cover all repairs, but the supplement. And again, they have a restricted, they have to they go to sell. They have to sell it at a maximum price of what they pay for it plus 2% every year. Okay. And it has to be to a qualified buyer. So usually through the NDCLT, NDCLT should help find the next buyer basically for the, the home. Okay. Did that make sense? Yes. Thank you. And Alvin, I just want to say thank you at the beginning. You mentioned like it's about community and relationships. And this is clearly much more than a phone call. So I look forward to speaking more and thank you for all of this information and yeah, getting, absolutely. I look forward to getting to know everyone more. So thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, We hope to meet you and I will go ahead and take this opportunity to also plug our upcoming events. So in particular um, for like getting to know each other, our first monthly membership meeting is Wednesday, September 11th. And it's going to be like a mix. It could be, you can come in person or join on Zoom. So it's going to be a hybrid event. I just put the link to RSVP in the chat. And it's in the evening, six o'clock, and we'll have food too. So come, we're figuring out exactly what the program is going to look like, but mainly getting to know everybody. Okay, now uh, you'll send us a reminder of that. We'll get an email about that also. Or... Yeah, you'll, you'll see email. So again, if you haven't yet, please sign up for membership. It's totally free. If you want to contribute something, you can. Um, but th this is how we do our email list. So become a member. And when we have stuff coming up, we send out emails out to folks, as well as like opportunities. If you're if you're interested in, in getting affordable housing through the Community Land Trust, say yes to that. 
you have a property that you might want to sell or donate to the CLT, say yes to that so we know to keep you on the loop on certain particular events and things. I guess I got one more question, and, and that is what are you doing to get the word out to try to get more members in and more houses available? Please spread the word. <laughs> 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 so kind of the conversations like this that we've been having over the, over the last couple of years, um, we do have um, WFI wants to do a story. So oh, cool. keep an ear out if you hear Aubriana Heron on the news sometime. Um, but mainly word of mouth. So please, like, if you think this might be of interest to some friends or neighbors of yours or family, please share with them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, if that's it, we'll go ahead and close it out. Let's give another round of applause. Thanks to Jeff, Matt, and Nicholas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate we appreciate you. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, appreciate y'all. And we'll hope to see you at the membership meeting. And Sherry, we'll have to talk more. Let's talk more. Have a good night, everyone. Right. You too. Have a great evening.